Welcome to the Who, What, Why podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Sheckman. We seem to be facing a time when the speech police are everywhere. A time when even the majority of progressive people simply seem to be losing faith in the value of free speech. All the while seeming to want to narrow the words that we can use. Don't you see, George Orwell wrote in 1984, the whole of Newspeak is to narrow the range of thought. In the end, he says, we shall make thought crime literally impossible because there will be no words in which to express it. Just what does free speech mean? Is it under threat today from the left and or the right? Why is it also about safety? And why are our colleges and universities front and center in this debate? We're going to talk about this with one of the intellectual guiding lights of the discussion of free speech, Professor Stanley Fish. He's the Davidson Kahn Distinguished University Professor of Humanities and Law at Florida International University and a visiting professor of law at Cardozo University. He has previously taught at Berkeley, Johns Hopkins, Duke, and the University of Illinois, Chicago, where he served as dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. His articles and essays have appeared in numerous publications. His most recent book is The First, and it is my pleasure to welcome Professor Stanley Fish to the Who, What, Why podcast. Stanley, thanks so much for joining us. Good to be back, Jeff. One of the things that you talk about is that we really don't do a very good job of defining what free speech is, that it's not really this magical thing that's out there. Yeah, we don't do a good job of defining what it is because it's impossible to define. It's not a simple uh, unilateral abstract thing. Uh, it's a set of decisions really made in, in different areas of application. And those decisions all use the term free speech or freedom of speech, but they don't always mean the same thing about by it because the stakes are not always the same. So it's going to depend on whether you're talking about an academic uh, setting or a setting in a Hyde Park corner context, that is a place where people get up on a soapbox and uh, speak uh, what's on their mind, or in a business setting uh, where, uh, of course, a speech is a part of doing business or in a political setting. All of these present different situations to which different responses uh, are uh, are made. Um, and again, although the term free speech is invoked in, in, in all of them, if you take a good look at them, uh, at the different situations, the term doesn't mean the same thing and isn't doing the same kind of work. In as much as it is part of our, our constitutional framework, is there a legal definition? Or is there a way that we can look at it within a legal construct that is helpful to trying to define it? Yeah, that's an excellent question. You can begin with the very basic notion that the government is not supposed to either interfere with the speech that you would like to produce or compel you to produce speech that the government wants you to produce. So you can start with that basic, that the government cannot tell you that you can't say something, nor can it put words in your mouth and demand that you speak them. Uh, and so we can. So that that that's fairly basic. But once you've said that, uh, you haven't said that much because most of the constraints on speech and most of the penalties for speaking are given out not by the government, but by your employer, uh, by your wife or husband or partner, uh, by your friends, uh, etc. Uh, so that's the point at which things become extremely complicated. The other part of it is is what defines speech itself when we've had the courts define even money as a form of speech in something like Citizens United. Yes. Uh, the definition of what is speech goes back and forth, uh, just as the definition of what is action goes back and forth. And in fact, these two opposites, speech versus action, are really not so opposite, but are intertwined. And a whole uh, succession of speech decisions by the Supreme Court uh, illustrates this. At times, the Supreme Court will declare that a form of action, like sleeping in a public park, is indeed an act of expression and should be protected. On the other hand, the Supreme Court will say that a form of action, like burning the flag, is also 
uh, free uh, expression. And on the other side, uh, in one decision it was said uh, that uh, uh, telling a policeman that he's a fascist is not an act of speech, uh, but is a piece of actionable uh, uh, activity and action. So the Supreme Court and all courts have this wonderful mechanism whereby they can turn speech into action and action into speech, uh, given the argumentative force to do so. And, of course, perhaps a good example of that is the idea that speech doesn't allow you to yell, you know, the proverbial fire in a crowded theater. Uh, well, to, to yell falsely. Right. Uh, that is, because if, in fact, there were a fire right. in a crowded <laughs> theater, you might, uh, you might be praised uh, for, for letting people know uh, what, what's going on. Uh, and, but that touches on another question. Uh, are lies... Uh, allowed and, in fact, indemnified under free speech law. And indeed, uh, since the Supreme Court case, New York Times versus Sullivan in 1964, lies uh, and uh, uh, misinformation uh, and, in fact, some forms of defamation uh, have been allowed uh, as forms uh, of, uh, of freedom of expression under the notion that even if they are false and misleading, they are part of the democratic conversation, and the democratic conversation uh, should uh, be kept going. Which goes to this other broader point that you talk about, that, that free speech isn't free, that it has consequences on the other side. Yeah, now of course that's obviously true when you're, not, when you're talking about uh, free speech contexts which are not ruled um, by the government. You can speak freely and then find yourself fired tomorrow for having done so, as long as the person or agent, file, file, uh, uh, I'm sorry, firing you is not, uh, is not the government. So that, for example, when some employers saw video clips of their employees at the Charlottesville um, Monument riots and saw them acting uh, on what was called the alt-right side, uh, they fired those employees, um, and, and those. And it's certainly true that those employees were fired uh, for actions which are arguably actions of speech, actions of protest, political actions, um, and uh, that the government says that political action is protected as a form of expression. What that means, of course, is that as a form of expression, it cannot be the basis for your being put in jail but it can be the basis for your being put out of work. One of the things you talk about is that, in, in going back to where we started, that it's not a thing specifically, but it is a kind of value. What, what does that mean exactly? Well, free speech as a value, as opposed to a principle, is the point that I try to make. If free speech were a principle in the strong sense, then there would be no exceptions to it, or only exceptions in extraordinary circumstances. But free speech as a value is in competition with other values. And once that competition occurs, then it uh, has to be decided, often by courts, which value uh, is, uh, is, is it more important to protect in this particular context. So, for example, um, if you wish to speak to women entering an abortion clinic, uh, assuming that there are any more abortion clinics left in the country, uh, then you have to you have you have to distance yourself uh, from anywhere from 35 to 100 uh, feet um, and uh, speak uh, in a respectful manner. That is a restraint on freedom of speech. Uh, and there are so many more of them that the idea of freedom of speech is something that we have uh, as an initial or default position before exceptions are grudgingly allowed just doesn't hold up. The context in which speech is freely produced without anxiety and without repercussions is ex almost non-existent. Why, in your view, has this become such a hot-button issue at colleges and universities today? In colleges and universities, 
what we have is a is a uh, rebellion on the part of some students and some faculty members against the traditional academic rules of engagement, which to some extent mirror traditional First Amendment obligations in that everyone should have a hearing, all points of view uh, should be heard and discussed, uh, and none should be sent away or demonized in advance. Now, there are a lot of students in our universities today, and as I said, uh, some faculty members, who believe that that simply is a device for allowing ideas that should not be expressed to gain a platform, racist ideas, anti-Semitic uh, ideas, um, homophobic ideas. And they believe that those ideas, rather than being uh, candidates for entry into the marketplace, should be excluded from the marketplace uh, from the beginning. And that's a battle that's going on on campuses right now, where, as I said a moment ago, the traditional rhetoric of freedom of speech is very much under attack. And within that context, it seems to go against the idea of of the uni college or university as a kind of marketplace for ideas. The whole reason something like tenure, for example, was created was to allow that marketplace to exist. Yeah, uh, what you have in the university uh, is, is a set of processes like tenure processes and other processes having to do with hiring and promotion and uh, dismissal designed to prevent institutions from disciplining, disciplining people because of their political views. If you're a university or a college, you discipline or uh, dismiss faculty members because their scholarship is shoddy, because they've been... Uh, because they've practiced uh, plagiarism, because they haven't shown up in class or haven't uh, given uh, uh, enough attention uh, to the papers of their students, all of those professional reasons. It shouldn't be, and this is a traditional point, it shouldn't be the case that a reason for you being disadvantaged and even fire, uh, fired uh, are the political views you happen to hold, but that's changing. And talk about the way that's changing and, and the broader context of, of this idea that somehow free speech was always some kind of an academic value. Well, free speech is not an academic value. Uh, free speech is a democratic value. That is, it's a value that is attached to the idea that every citizen has a voice and that voice has an equal right uh, to be heard. In the academy, uh, almost the reverse is true. The voices that are heard are the voices that have passed muster with a series of committees, with deans, uh, with provosts, with presidents, with the editors of learned journals. All of those uh, offices and persons are in the business of excluding speakers rather than enlarging the uh, pool uh, of speakers. And that's what I mean when I say that free speech is not an academic value. Freedom of inquiry is an academic value. But in order for freedom of inquiry to go in a uh, successful direction, that, that is, in the direction toward the identification of the truth, you have to have devices for excluding people um, whose uh, research uh, methods uh, or uh, knowledge uh, of the field uh, mark them as unworthy of inclusion. This phenomenon that's taking place in colleges and universities, is it, is it a recent phenomenon in your view, or is it something that's been lurking for longer than we think? It's been lurking forever. That is, in the, in the 19th century, uh, when many of our colleges and universities uh, were uh, established uh, by churches, uh, there were uh, many um, uh, politi politically inspired sanctions uh, against uh, against instructors uh, who said things that the um, founders uh, of the institution would not ha have agreed with. Uh, and a little later on, uh, boards of trustees began to play the same role. And there have always been a number of constituencies that want to influence uh, and indeed to take over uh, university procedures with the idea of making the university uh, into a mirror of their own views. And these include corporations that provide funds, uh, parents, uh, uh, ordinary donors, 
of course, politicians, all of whom, in their various ways and at various times with various uh, rates uh, of success, have tried to substitute their point of view for the university's point of view. And, of course, the university's point of view is or should be that all points of view deserve a hearing. And if, after having been heard, the point of view is, uh, uh, is, is found to be illegitimate, of course, it is sent away. But that's quite uh, different from uh, uh, taking the, uh, making the university uh, into a theater or a mirror of your own partisan views, whatever they might be. How does this play out from here, do you think? I think, unfortunately, that the, uh, what's, what's been called uh, derisively by the right, the woke culture, uh, is now strongly entrenched um, in many, not all universities, probably less entrenched, let's say, uh, in community colleges and state colleges uh, than it is in liberal arts colleges and in important uh, state uh, state-sponsored uh, uh, universities, but in that higher echelon of college uh, of colleges and, and universities, I would say that the the program or agenda which wants to make the university a spokesperson for virtue uh, is very much in the ascendancy. And, of course, in order to do that, you have to decide which positions are the virtuous ones. And once you've decided that, you can then decide which speakers can be heard, which professors should be hired or fired, which courses should be given uh, or not given, et cetera. Uh, and I'm afraid that uh, this process uh, is very much advanced. And does it reach a point, though, where it just collapses of its own weight, that it just gets carried too far? Well, I think it's carried too far the moment it begins. Right. <laughs> um, that's my view. But uh, I remember, I remember back in the '80s, which was a mild '70s and '80s, which was a milder version uh, uh, of the campus atmosphere we have now. Uh, people were always standing up uh, at meetings to denounce their colleagues because uh, uh, they had detected in the writing of their colleagues. Uh, dangerous hostages to the old conservatism, which must be expelled at any cost. Uh, at the time, I called that the lefter than thou uh, move. Uh, you get up and after someone has given a paper or made a remark at a conference, uh, you denounce him or her for not, having, uh, for not being sufficiently to the left. Well, I think that's happening now uh, with uh, increasing uh, with increasing speed, uh, and what it means is that more and more, uh, more and more bodies of materials, uh, texts, uh, subject matters uh, are coming under suspicion. Uh, and in the end, as others have uh, before me have said, there will be nothing left uh, because everything will have been declared tainted. Right, and 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 that period of time in the seventies and eighties that you're talking about was even before things like you know safe spaces and trigger warnings that we hear about today. Yes, well, all of that vocabulary, safe spaces, trigger warnings, uh, cultural uh, uh, appropriations, microaggressions, um, and the rest, they are again all ways of turning the university into a place where only certain ideas and points of view uh, are uh, allowed a platform because it is assumed in advance uh, that um, those are the points of view that virtuous people uh, would in fact have. And if you don't have that point of view, you're not a virtuous person. And there's no reason for us uh, to treat you fairly or to treat you at all. Talk about the way in which you think that this bleeds into the larger culture right now. Is it, is it the culture that's feeding into what's happening at the universities, or is it the other way around? I think it's the other way around. I think that the university is exporting uh, this set of ideas, although there is, of course, some receptivity uh, to those ideas on the side, for example, of the protesters who have uh, been so prominent uh, 
uh, in recent months. Uh, and uh, you can, I have more sympathy, uh, at least of an abstract kind, with those protesters than I do with the student uh, protesters. Because the protesters that we've seen uh, since, uh, especially uh, since the death uh, of George, George Floyd, are protesting against rules and regulations and bodies of law uh, that are demonstrably broken and not working in the direction of justice as they promised to be. So I would make a distinction between a set of ideas that is operating in the political sphere under the name of the achievement of justice and a set of ideas that is operating in the academic sphere under the name, as far as I am concerned, uh, of throwing out everything the university has ever stood for. Do you think that there there is some reckoning coming with regard to all of this, that it will enable us at some point to better define, better understand what free speech should mean? No. <laughs> I don't think we'll ever do that. I think that because, as I say many times, free speech is not a single thing, not something that you can point to and isolate. Uh, it, it's shape and uh, the effect, effects of, uh, of, of affirming it uh, will always be different. And I think that's what's going to happen, uh, as, it always, as, it, as it has happened. What is understood by free speech, what is understood to be the benefits or non-benefits of free speech, will be uh, continually uh, uh, changing and, and, and uh, a matter of debate. I would add that this free speech question in general has been very much changed or even transformed by the success and pervasiveness of the um, Internet. It used to be the case that speech was a scarce resource uh, and that it was uh, feared that some entity like the government uh, would in fact hoard the resource and deprive individual citizens of their share of that resource. Now there is nothing scarce about speech. Anyone can set up a website uh, or, uh, or a podcast, um, and the means of doing so are, are, are many, um, and the uh, extent of the uh, reach uh, of, of these vehicles of communications is literally illimitable. Uh, and what that means is that the more speech you have, which is the old First Amendment ideal, we should have more and more speech. Now that ideal has been realized, and the result is an inability uh, to tell the difference between forms of speech that are reliable uh, and authentic and forms of speech uh, that are corrupt uh, and, as they say, fake. So that I think that the free speech landscape is entirely different now that the Internet uh, is so much a fact uh, of life uh, for us. And you see Facebook, and Twitter, uh, and other uh, large platforms wrestling uh, with, with this question as they attempt at the same time uh, to be f a true uh, to their freedom of speech principles, at least as they have been declared, and, and yet they don't want to become the receptacle and conveyor of lies, uh, distortion, uh, and let's say the word filth. I mean, it's as if the, the marketplace of ideas that you talked about before has become some wide-open bazaar. Absolutely. The, we now do have the marketplace of ideas. Before, it was just an abstraction. No one could find it. Uh, you couldn't visit it or ask what its hours are. Uh, now, the marketplace of ideas is everywhere, and it's always open, and everyone has access to it. And that was the old dream of First Amendment uh, uh, theorists, uh, that no bars, no impediments, no gatekeepers, no filters, um, just speech allowed freely uh, to be produced and freely and widely, in fact, universally, to be disseminated, and then the truth would emerge. Well, that's not what's happened. Perhaps the original free speech advocates, the original First Amendment advocates, would be 
pretty shocked by the way it's turned out. Well, of course, imagining what the founders, uh, the writers of the Constitution, would have thought um, is, is the cottage industry. Right. <laughs> uh, um, um, is, is a game. Uh, but, of course, we have to realize that these men, and they were all men at the time, were extraordinarily brilliant. And uh, if they were operating, uh, if they had been able to foresee some of the things that would have happened, uh, they would have been able to uh, adjust uh, their formulas uh, and uh, codes and rules uh, to it. Uh, but, you know, uh, I myself uh, uh, don't much believe in in the asking the question, uh, what would Madison have said or what would Jefferson uh, have said? I'm more interested in the, in the question, what is the Supreme Court saying today? And of course, on this particular day, the Supreme Court is saying a lot. Professor Stanley Fish, I thank you so much for spending time with us. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Jeff. And I'd love to come back anytime. Thank you. Appreciate it. And thank you for listening and for joining us here on Radio Who, What, Why. I hope you join us next week for another Radio Who, What, Why podcast. I'm Jeff Sheckman. If you like this podcast, please feel free to share and help others find it by rating and reviewing it on iTunes. You can also support this podcast and all the work we do by going to whowhatwhy.org forward slash donate.